These following stories are taken from the latest series of my podcast, Deliver Us, which is available on Apple Podcasts and most other podcasting platforms. For those new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy my storytelling and check out the podcast in the links in the channel description. Bargode, a small town in the carefully county borough of the South Wales Valleys, was, in the early part of the 20th century, a profitable coal mining town. In the 1970s, the colliery was closed, which left a car factory as the main source of the town's industry. When the car factory closed in 1999, it left Bargo to befall the same fate as many mining towns in the UK, becoming a place of little growth and opportunity. And so Bargode became another quaint British town, fitted with the usual high street chain stores, banks and estate agents that made it indiscernible from any other. It was also the home of Gladstone Villa, which was the childhood home of Andrew Dexter and went on to be known as one of the most haunted places in the town. Welcome to Deliver Us. During the 1960s, Andrew's mother, Caroline, lived in the property with her father, Bill, a retired miner who had worked in the local colliery, and her mother, Rita. Caroline worked at a local bakehouse during the day, where one morning she encountered a young gentleman called Charles Dexter, who was leaving at the end of the night shift. Charles took a clear liking to Caroline and started a daily routine of staying behind after working his shift to make Caroline a cup of tea before she started her day shift. The morning routine turned into dating, and after three years the couple got married in the year 1968. They did not get their own place, but rather moved in with Caroline's parents in the villa, as it was large enough to accommodate the family comfortably. Less than a year after getting married, Caroline became pregnant with Andrew, and in August of 1969, he was born. There is something strangely coincidental that happens in a lot of paranormal stories. When a child is brought into a home that has had seemingly no activity, it seems to trigger paranormal behaviour. It was when Andrew was brought into the home that strange events started to occur. The first thing the family noticed was the occasional tapping noise in the home. It was strange, but something that could be dismissed as old plumbing. One evening... The family was sat in the living room after having dinner. The family had a television and would often spend evenings in front of it watching whatever show happened to be broadcast on the limited amount of channels at the time. What would have been an ordinarily pleasant evening was all of a sudden interrupted by a loud thud coming from the upstairs of the home. The family sat there in shock for a moment, having heard the unexpected and unfamiliar sound. Bill got up and turned down the volume to the television. Caroline pointed out that it sounded like something or someone had fallen out of the attic door and onto the upstairs landing. The only logical explanation they could think of was that it was an intruder who had somehow got in through the attic. Bill and Charles went upstairs to investigate. They found the attic door open and searched the villa, but found nothing. No signs that any person, any physical person anyway, had been up there. The attic could have possibly opened up itself, but the thumping sound could not be explained away by anything. They returned to the living room and tried to continue their evening, but no one could take their mind off the strange occurrence. That night, Bill and Rita were in bed. The lights were out and they were drifting off to sleep. Their night was disturbed, however, by the clear sound of footsteps. At first, Bill tried to tell himself that what he was hearing was someone outside the room. Charles was working the night shift, so it must have been Caroline. However, eventually it dawned on him that the sound he was hearing was coming from within the room. He tentatively opened his eyes and looked around the bedroom, trying his hardest not to move so as not to scare any potential intruder into reacting violently. After his eyes adjusted to the light, he was able to do a full scan of the room and realised no one was there. The footsteps continued. He reached over and turned on the light on his bedroom nightstand and searched the room, but found no one hiding anywhere. He left the room and went to check on Caroline to see if she was up and about. Everyone was in bed. Bill went back to bed and by this point the sound had ceased. 
By morning, they had forgotten about the previous evening's events and went about their day. Some nights later, the family finished their evening of entertainment and retired to bed. Bill and Rita were in bed, about to go to sleep. They were disturbed again by the sound of footsteps in their room. They lay there, frozen for a while, trying to figure out where this noise could be coming from. Bill turned his bedside lamp on again and saw nothing in the room. The noise paused for a moment and then started up again, but this time they heard a dragging sound along with it. Bill got up and searched around, but found no source of the sound. Andrew described his family as teleaddicts when he was growing up. To Andrew, the 1960s and 70s was, after all, the golden age of television. So, sitting in the living room to watch whatever was being broadcast was a nightly ritual for the family. One evening, they were gathered together when Bill got up, walked to the TV turning the volume down, and hushing the family motioned them to listen in the direction of the main bedroom above them. The family sat there for a few moments when all of a sudden, they heard what Bill was pointing to. The footsteps coming from above them, walking back and forth the upstairs of their home, became a frequent occurrence in the property. Charles, continuing to work the night shift at the bakehouse, would often sleep through the afternoon and evenings until Caroline would come and wake him. One evening, she went into their bedroom and was surprised to find Charles asleep with the ironing board laying on top of him. With no explanation of how it got there, Charles concluded that Bill must have been playing some sort of prank on him. Bill fervently denied any of these allegations. Eventually, the family came to realise that this must have been the activity of the ghost. Caroline and Charles were very young when they had gotten married. Sadly, as the years went by, cracks started to appear and when Andrew was only two years old, his parents separated. Charles left his family at Gladstone Villa and the entity that was haunting it. Charles remained a part of Andrew's life, looking after him on Saturdays, often taking him to the local cinema. Andrew was too young to remember his father living at Gladstone Villa. But as he grew up in the family home, he became aware of the strange, unexplainable activity that was occurring there. The next strange occurrences that manifested in the home centred around the electrical appliances. Wall plugs started to get pulled from their sockets. Andrew was once witness to this occurrence. It wasn't a situation where the family would find disconnected plugs when returning to unoccupied rooms. Andrew actually saw the plugs being pulled from the wall sockets by some unseen force. In addition to this, the lights in the house started to turn themselves off, usually when Bill would play his records on a Sunday. The television also seemed to be a trigger, though strangely the entity would make an exception when Rita would watch her religious programmes. Although the family did get used to the activity, it wasn't without its annoyances. The local police were contacted and came to inspect the property. They searched around the house, but found no explanation for what could be causing what the family were reporting. When they were in the upstairs of the house, they checked out the attic. However, upon getting towards the top of the steps, something caused them to hesitate before going all the way up there. They poked their heads in and looked around, but refused to enter the attic. Maybe they sensed the presence of something, and despite trying as best as possible to be the voice of reason to the family, couldn't help their nerves getting the better of them. Before leaving, they tried to convince the family that someone must have been playing a series of practical jokes on them. Ivy France was a close friend to Rita, and a sceptic of the reported events being caused by something paranormal. She visited the villa and went into the bedroom with reported activity. Her explanation for the occurrences was that it must have been caused by vibrations from vehicles passing on the road outside. As if on cue, the footsteps returned. Rita tried to search for another source of the noise, but came up with nothing. Experiencing the occurrence firsthand transformed her from a sceptic to a believer in the paranormal. Amazed, she told the family they should look into getting a medium. They contacted a local medium by the name of John Matthews to come and visit the property. He came into the home and sat with the family in the living room asking them questions about them, their lives, and eventually about the activity that was occurring in the property. Once he gathered the information he needed, he started his inspection in the home. 
He began by challenging the spirit to knock back at him, and sure enough, they heard the knocking coming from the ceiling. After asking a series of questions and getting knocks in return, John wanted to dig a little deeper, and so went into the process of getting himself into some kind of trance to make further contact. He was in this state for a short while. When he eventually returned back to a normal state of consciousness, he confirmed the family did have a presence in their home. It was an earthbound spirit that would have likely have had some unfinished business. Unfortunately, John wasn't able to get the name of the spirit. The family brought in a priest to bless the property, and for a while there was no activity. It was almost as if the blessing made the spirit go dormant, but when it returned, it came back with a vengeance. One evening, the family were sat in the living room. Andrew, his mother Caroline and grandfather Bill were watching TV, whilst his grandmother Rita read a book. It slowly dawned on Caroline that she started to feel the uneasy sense that she was being watched. She tried to ignore it and focus on the TV program they were watching. Something in the doorway to the living room caught the corner of her eye. She turns to look and sees a figure standing there. It was robed dressed like a 16th century Benedictine monk with his hood pulled up over his head. As soon as she comprehended what she was seeing, letting out a gasp, the figure disappeared. No one else was able to turn to look in time to see it. Bill had a friend by the name of Fred Davis. After they had both retired from working in the colliery, they had remained friends and Fred would frequently come to visit the family home. Fred was a slim man who wore a flat cap and smoked roll-your-own cigarettes. When visiting the family, he would always sit in the same spot, by the fireplace in the living room. It was a cold day, and Fred was sat in his usual spot with a lit cigarette bobbing up and down between his lips as he talked with the family whilst they watched television. The fire was burning, keeping the family warm, creating a cosy atmosphere. The warm comfort was instantly broken by a loud bang coming from above them. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head, thinking something was hammering its way through the ceiling towards him. The family and their friends sat there in silence for a while. Fred had heard about the haunting, but this was his first experience of any activity. Curious and keen to know what caused the noise, Fred joined the family in their hunt for the origin of it throughout the upstairs of the home. They searched each and every room, but found nothing. This wasn't the only experience Fred was to have in the home. When he wasn't listening to records or watching television, Bill would often spend time in the upstairs landing of the villa where, at the end of the hallway, a window was situated that had a view of all of Gladstone. He enjoyed gazing out over the town, so one afternoon, when Fred came to visit, he joined Bill in this spot as he enjoyed the view and conversation. Fred's attention was drawn away from whatever discussion the two old friends were having by the feeling of someone very clearly brushing up against him. He swiftly turned around to see who it was, expecting to see one of Bill's family members coming to join them, but was taken aback when he came to the conclusion that no one was there. Andrew was once in the bedroom in which the activity was centred. Perhaps his youthful self was testing his daringness to see how long he could stay in the room alone with the fear that something may manifest. He made sure the light was on as sitting there in the dark might make things too unnerving. Plus, there was always more threat of some dark shadow playing tricks with his imagination. He lay on the bed, staring out of the window. Nothing happened for some time and he began to feel somewhat silly lying on a bed that wasn't his. Out of nowhere, he felt the weight of something hopping onto the bed. The bed springs made a sound along with a sensation of the bed bouncing up and down. He froze, unable to muster up the courage to turn and look to see what it could be. Eventually, he told himself to man up and look at the spot where the weight was felt. When he eventually did, he saw there was nothing there. He ran downstairs to tell his family. Upon further investigation, they noticed paw marks on the bed. Bill went on to explain to Andrew that before he was born, he had a Labrador that passed away in the home. Rita would often wake up before Bill in the mornings and would go downstairs to make tea before the rest of the house would start moving. One morning, she went back up the stairs to get Bill out of bed. 
In their bedroom, there was a closet that housed a boiler, the door to which remained closed most of the time. This particular morning, she walked back into the room to witness the door opening by itself. She left the room as quickly as she could. The other incident that Rita experienced was the sensation that something had been pulled from underneath her foot. It was almost as if she had trodden on someone's gown and they had quickly pulled it from underneath. The activity continued for such a long time that Rita gave the spirit a name. She called him Johnny. Bill would sometimes shout the name about the house to provoke a reaction, but nothing would ever happen. Andrew's mother Caroline had an operation on her toe and had to spend some time on crutches. A nurse stopped by the house for a home visit to attend to her. They were in the living room and Rita was also present. The nurse knelt down to take a look at Caroline's foot and before she got there, she froze on the spot. She struggled to move to get closer to Caroline and with a confused expression on her face, she called out to Rita who was stood behind her to let go of her. Rita proclaimed she was nowhere near her. Eventually, the nurse was set free and explained she felt the sensation of hands holding onto her preventing her from getting closer to Caroline. There was only one time that Andrew reported hearing the ghost. Someone, Andrew didn't recall who, was waiting to get into the bathroom but the door was locked from the other side. Bill approached the door exclaiming, He's behind there. Andrew approached the door to listen but all he heard was the sound of a Gregorian chant. The events came to an end for Andrew and his family when they sold the property in 1978 to developers who turned it into a hotel. The last night the family spent in their home had some unexplained activity. It was almost as if the presence in their home was giving them one final send-off. Andrew, his mother and grandmother were on the upstairs landing on their way to bed after finishing up the last bit of packing. They were stopped in their tracks by the sound of something coming from the room in which most of the activity was experienced. The door handle was turning back and forth of its own accord. They called out to Bill, who had gone to bed earlier to see if he was on the other side of the door playing one of his pranks. But they heard no answer. Normally, he would let out a laugh when attempting to scare the family, but there wasn't any response. The eerie silence was suddenly followed by a series of loud thumping and crashing sounds coming from the downstairs area, causing the three of them to jump. Once the sound ceased, they tentatively ventured down the stairs to see what could have been the cause of the noise. They found all their belongings that they had neatly packed into the living room ready to be loaded into the vehicles the next morning had been thrown around the room. Andrew grew older and started his own family and the events in Gladstone Villa became his campfire stories. He spent his 40th birthday at the Reds Park Hotel, which is what Gladstone Villa is known as today. He instigated a conversation with the staff about his experiences growing up, and they went into detail about their own experiences whilst working there. Lights would switch themselves on and off of their own accord, along with reports of strange sightings in Room 5, the room that had most of the activity whilst Andrew's family lived there. There were also reports of the sighting of a woman in a white dress roaming the property in addition to the sounds of a child crying. Andrew took it upon himself to do his own research into the property to see if he would discover where the activity could have originated from. He found most of his research in the local library, where he discovered that Gladstone Villa dated back to 1900 and was given its name after the former British Prime Minister, William Gladstone. He was able to find a history of all the previous occupants of the property. Reports of hauntings were started by the Mills family who occupied the property before Andrew's family moved in. However, Andrew's most interesting find was during the 1920s, Michael and Evelyn Kimmett lived there. They had a son, Elvin Kimmett, who died at just four months old in the property. This would explain the sounds of a child crying in the home. I can't imagine anything worse for a human being than the death of your own child. The negative energy that would have fallen upon the home after this event would explaining it becoming a hotbed of paranormal activity. Andrew also did some research into some of the properties surrounding Gladstone Villa and discovered that nearby was a monastery. Opposite the villa was a building that apparently was formerly a priest hide. 
Priest hides or holes were built into Catholic houses during the 1500s, when Catholics were persecuted by law. Queen Elizabeth I had had several Catholic plots designed to remove her, and severe measures were taken against the priests. These holes were built to hide and protect the priests. So, the nearby monastery and the hide could explain the manifestation of a monk in the property. This story was based on true events and was written, narrated and produced by me, James Deverell. Thank you for listening to this podcast. It was made possible by the person who agreed to let me tell their story. It was also made possible by you, my listeners. Without you, I wouldn't feel compelled to find these stories, write and narrate them and share them with you on this platform. I love telling stories and I truly believe there is a great importance for storytelling in our world. It invokes the imagination and opens us up to a greater sense of empathy through shared human experiences. That is the reason why I do what I do, and I hope one day to be able to do it more than I am currently able to. So if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and help it to grow by subscribing on the platform you are listening on, and leaving a positive review. To go beyond some of the episodes and get access to original Skype interviews with some of the people who feature in my stories, go ahead and check out my Patreon account. Patreon contributors donating $5 or more get access to exclusive interviews and a Patreon-only audio feed in which I narrate the original stories I find. Also, go ahead and check me out on Twitter at Daredevil and Instagram at James Deverell. Finally, if you happen to have a paranormal story you would like me to tell on this podcast, please contact me at mrsinisterstories at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening.